So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and it's time for your virtual star party for February 24th, 2013. So once again tonight, we're going to hook up a whole bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout, and we will show you the... The night sky. I said to mute, Stuart. Um, we're going to show you the night sky live. So we're going to show you, uh, we got a nice live view of Jupiter tonight. I think we'll be able to get the moon, although it's almost full moon. We're going to be able to get a bunch of deep sky objects to be able to show you as well tonight. So I think it's going to be a good night. Now the problem is we've got this, this almost full moon, which is going to be pretty bad news for uh, being able to see a lot of the deep sky objects. So we're going to have to kind of deal with that. Uh, so joining me tonight, we've got, uh, we've got this is great. It's like a reunion of a lot of the people who joined us early on. So we've got Chris Ridgway. Hello. Hey, Chris. And he's showing us this view of Jupiter tonight. Not very well, but not <laughs> very well. You've got to transfer the dust across the face of it. Yeah, you've got a couple of you got a couple of no. We're going to call those yeah transits of uh, of dust boats. <laughs> so those aren't actually uh, uh, moons of Jupiter, unfortunately. Newfound storms, maybe. <laughs> Newfound storms. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we got Gary Ganella. Hey, Gary. Hi guys. Uh, we got Louis Bamakos, who um, th he's showing us a uh, an, an old, an archived photograph. So definitely not a a current photograph. Um, but uh, he's he's clouded out tonight, but he's going to join us for color commentary. Maybe show us some of the pictures that he's done because he's got some some beautiful beautiful pictures that he's taken. Uh, we got Mark Barrent in Chicago, and Mark is showing us uh, also the Orion Nebula. Hi guys, this is great. Mark was one of the first people to join us back in the, you know, like a year back ago in the, the Star Parks. Back in the day, yeah. He's so old school, Mark. <laughs> He's <I> totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, got De Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host on Astronomy mean? Cast. Whoa, where's that coming from? Oh well. Uh, nope. That was my phone vibrating, telling me that the virtual star party just went live. Oh, okay, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> hey, guess what, Mark? <laughs> the virtual star party's gone live. <laughs> yeah, just, this just in. Um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host on Astronomy Cast, she's going to bring the PhD astronomy knowledge tonight. Scott Lewis, my co-host for the virtual star party. Hey, everyone. Uh, the person who does all the things. <laughs> all the things. Um... And Stuart Foreman, who's located in San Francisco and is Hello. showing us this beautiful view of the Orion Nebula as well. And what's really great about this picture is you can see the trapezium, which are those four stars right at the heart of the Orion Nebula. And with because he's done actually a very short exposure on this this picture. So, Stuart, do you want to talk a bit about, about this picture? Sure. This Ooh. is um, a 10-second exposure at ISO 400. So it's pretty, you know, pretty dim. Uh, but I did that specifically since I didn't want to blow out the core, and uh, you can. See, and it's also very heavily cropped. And I have a um, an uncropped M42 kind of in the queue here, which I'll show you in a second, so you can see the difference. But um, in the middle of the core of the Orion Nebula, there's four stars, which are called the trapezium. And um, Pamela can tell us more about the science behind those, but um, uh, you don't normally see those in our M42 shots because we take 60 to 120 second, you know, shots, and this area gets completely blown out. And you'll see that in my next picture I'll show, it is completely blown out. You cannot see them. What I think is great is all through the summer, everyone is asking us to show them images of the Orion Nebula, and the Orion Nebula is down over the summer, and then it comes up in wintertime, and then we're going to get, you know, we get really beautiful pictures of the of the Orion Nebula, and now we have four of them. So for all the people all the summer long who asked us for images of the Orion Nebula, <laughs> here are four simultaneous images of the same object. But but yeah, so you can see here. This is I'm showing you Gary's view right now, and you can really see how just the center of the nebula itself is just a big white blob, with the uh, with the rest of the nebula, you know, a lot fainter and it's a lot more you know subtle. But that core part is just so bright that it's just white. And then with Mark's view, same thing. You can really see. Uh, well, no, actually, Mark, you can really see the trapezium in there, just the four stars. Yeah, if we go in pretty close, we can see the, the trapezium in there, uh, and, you know, you get some of the finer detail in that big blowout area. You know, yeah. the, the real trick is to get a bunch of exposures across all sorts of different ranges so you can get some detail on everything. Yeah, it's one of those, that, it's that technique of doing um, the high dynamic range, the HDR, and that's how you get those really cool images. We see a lot of them on Google+, right, where people are, they'll take an image at a, 
at a really short exposure, and then they'll do a medium exposure, and then a bit of a longer exposure, or different different apertures, and then they'll they'll merge that image together, and so you get detail on both the sort of fainter items, but also detail on the stuff that would be really bright and be overexposing the rest of the image, and you get you can really see that subtle detail. But uh, these are just one exposure that people are doing. Uh, and then here's Stuart's view, right. as promised. Yeah, so this is the uncropped view uh, in my F7 uh, refractor, and you can see oh, you know, how much, mo how much wow. smaller it is. Um, and this is a 120-second exposure. And so you can um, see some of the nebulosity on, on the outside. It's kind of pretty. And this is with a full moon. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, you know, kind of pretty. Yeah. <laughs> it could be better, Stuart, if you didn't I mean, have fun. I, I know. No, that's that's amazing. Stuff. Yeah, it's an amazing image. Yeah. Wow. I can't believe this. And, and this. not only not only is it a full moon, but the moon is very near Orion to be particularly annoying. Yeah, and right. I have a street light across the street, but who's counting? <laughs> yeah, I was taking some uh, some pictures. I was doing like a time lapse uh, with my. Uh, with with my DSLR and it was really great but there was the whole picture was taken on this red color and I couldn't figure out what the problem was and it turns out there was a street light and the light was coming in the side of the lens and then just overexposing the the sort of the background of the whole picture and so just every image kept getting red and red and I couldn't figure out what the problem was and it was this street light and so I just needed to turn the camera away and then it was and then it was it was fine or a pellet so could, gun or Bell yeah. Yeah. I would love I would love to shoot out that light. That I, that light just shines right through my window and just drives me crazy. I would love to get rid of it. Well, the other I'm, trick Fraser is, is to shine the laser on the uh, photo sensor to think it's daytime and make the light go out. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I have a laser. <laughs> Those I'm are dangerous that. words. Hearing Fraser go, I have a laser. I have a laser. That is I, I, I think he's been practicing uh, the Dr. Horrible laugh to, to prepare for that. Yes. Yes. That is fiendish. I'm totally going to try that. Am, will I go to jail? <laughs> Only if you get caught. Most likely not. I was going to say, probably not. <laughs> probably yeah, that's not. a good idea. i got to try that. Those are, though. I'll oh. try it first, Fraser, and then I'll tell you if it works. That's that's a great idea. That's right. You just, hit the photo just so you all know, we're going out live <laughs> to a large audience of yeah. people who can figure out where you live. What by to tell to tell if I've turned my street light off? Yeah. <laughs> we do not advocate for the <laughs> no, we don't. City that's a, property. That's, that's a terrible idea. And if, and if you know, if tonight my street light is somehow turned off, it's purely coincidence. <laughs> I'm not, it wasn't me. Um, so just to remind everyone, uh, we're glad to answer any questions you have about space and astronomy, about gear, about telescopes, uh, about cameras, uh, technique, and even just oh, um, just general uh, science stuff, because we've got a PhD astrophysicist here with us, uh, and a lot of combined you know astronomy knowledge and observing knowledge and astrophotography. So it would be great. Now there's a bunch of places you can ask your questions. You can ask your questions on the event page, which is on Google Plus. Uh, you can ask your question if you're just if the if you're in the stream, like you know. We're, um, on Google Plus, if it's in like my posting or someone else's, a reshare of that. We'll try to catch that. Uh, you, if you're using uh, Twitter, you can uh, just use the hashtag Star Party, and we'll get it there. Or you can watch it over on YouTube, and we're glad to answer any questions that you have. So I can see a bunch. <laughs> Amanda Stevens says, "I have a." Amanda Stevens says, "I have a laser." Yeah, <laughs> I think that's going to be done in history. Hey, you know, I think I'm going to turn that into my uh, text notification. I'm going to go through and download that. Yeah, I have you a can release it on the on the hey, Android market. When, and... <laughs> when, when Fraser sends Fraser? you a text, it'll say, "I have a laser." Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so Stuart, uh, what are we looking at here? This is uh, NGC twenty one sixty nine. Um, also known as the 37 cluster, and um, I rotated it and cropped it so we can actually see uh, the 37 in it. And um, it's an asterism. It's they're uh, these they're just randomly lined up like this, but um, uh, it's kind of cool. It's not the 42 cluster, but it's the 37 we cluster. We still haven't found the 42 cluster. No, we have not. Yeah, yeah. We should. So we just should it's NGC 3639. 
Uh, twenty one sixty nine, I believe. Twenty one sixty nine. Yeah, I totally screwed that up. Okay, <laughs> this is a little off there. But this has become a, a favorite, and and someone asked for it like about about a month ago, and uh, and it was great. Actually, there's a if anyone caught the episode of the Star Party where we actually saw it for the first time, Nicole, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it was it's absolutely classic because we're all like one by one. You know, turning our heads and and recognizing the the thirty seven, and and Nicole <laughs> takes about another minute or so and says, "Oh, I see it," and and so I did my presentation uh, to the Science Online conference in um, in North Carolina, and I was able to sort of present that snippet of video, and it was great to see you know five hundred people. All going like this, <laughs> <laughs> all at the same time, and then uh, and then Nicole goes, "Oh, I see it," and uh, and the whole crowd just laughed. So it was. We great love you, history. Nicole. She yeah. she's mm -hmm. out of town right now, but I'm sure she'll yeah. watch this later. But yeah. we love you. Yeah. And then I and then she's I asked Nicole, flying her if, way home. Yeah, and I said, Nicole, do you see it now? Yeah, in the middle of the crowd. It was great. <laughs> it was great. Um, but uh, that's a that's a fantastic. Are, are there more stuff like this? I mean, there's the coat hanger cluster, but the problem is it's such a, a wide field of view, right? Um, no, this one is actually well. The coat hanger cluster is is very wide. Gary might yeah. be able to get it actually in the summer. I think he's tried and, and, and yeah. tried. Yeah, yeah, it's even too wide for Gary. Yeah, it's it's a binocular one. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, so Mark has brought us to the moon, and this is this is the enemy tonight. The enemy. Yeah. Since the dawn of time, mankind has wished to destroy but the moon. But it, it's a stunningly beautiful enemy that will even be more beautiful tomorrow in full moon. Yeah. Yeah. We are uh, one day away from the full moon. And so, I don't know, Mark, can you digitally zoom over onto that left-hand side where we've got the uh, the Terminator? Which, maybe which do you want? Uh, the Terminator. Just get some, you what, know, the edge. What, the what, little bit, what little bit of it is, there is. Yeah. It's over there. Yeah. Over there on the, moon. <laughs> on the moon. Yeah. Terminators on the moon. Yeah, so you can really see that we just we get very little of the of the shadows now. Looks like my focus isn't perfect either. Well now's your chance to fine tune it with this zoomed up mode. See the problem is I have to run up up and down the stairs to go out to the telescope <laughs> to do it. <laughs> oh. oh fail. Ready, go. <laughs> it, it's called Did you get budget the text astronomy. message the virtual star party started. I got there. <laughs> what is what is a what is a clear, you know, what are how cold is it when it's clear there in Chicago? Uh well, it's actually pretty warm tonight cuz it it's right above it's right below freezing. It's actually at freezing right now, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually pretty balmy compared to what it's been like the last week or so where it's been like 5 or so Fahrenheit. Yeah. I have to put Fahrenheit on it because I know you, Fraser, are on that <laughs> no, whole metric no. thing. Yeah, yeah it, it's 16 Celsius right now, so I, I love you guys. <laughs> Actually, it was it was pretty warm today, but now there's like a weird storm that's that's blown in today, and it's like w really hard wind and rain coming sideways at us. So, um, oh no. Yeah, so I'm glad I don't have a telescope. Um, so T. Martin, eighteen ninety nine, asks, can you explain why when I look through my Orion Nebula through my scope, I don't see that amazing red color? Pamela. Your eyeballs aren't that sensitive is the problem. Our, our eyes have two different types of photo, resense, photo sensors. Some of them simply go light, no light, and my camera's over here. Um, and and it, those ones that go light, no light, are sensitive to all the different colors. They trigger very easily. You may not realize it, but whenever you're in low light conditions, you don't actually see color, although your brain may fill in color for things that it knows. Uh, you also have, mostly concentrated in the center of your vision, uh, color receptors that are sensitive to red, green, blue. And so they will only trigger when they see enough red photons, enough green photons. And in low light circumstances, or looking at faint objects through telescopes, you just don't get enough light hitting your eye to trigger the color color sensors, so you're only triggering the more peripheral black and white sensors. This is why when you aren't sure you can see something through a telescope or not, you should actually look slightly sideways inside the eyepiece and use your peripheral vision to try and see that galaxy or star cluster. It's even like just with the sky. I mean, you look up into the sky and you can often notice galaxies or star clusters out of the corner of your eye, and then when you look directly at them, you can't quite see them. So 
it's the same thing going on. Um, well, I'm going to move over to Gary's new view of the uh, of the Horsehead Nebula and a satellite. And two satellites. Oh, there's two. Sa there are two satellites in there. And for those that don't know, the reason I can tell it's a satellite and not an airplane is because there's not flashes going through it. Yeah. When it's nice solid light, it's a satellite. And Lewis, yeah. you had a you had a, a similar photo up just a second ago. I don't know if you could bring that one back. Your your version oh, of the horse head that would be great. Sure. Yeah. Let me find it. Is is there a third satellite or is that a, a hot pixel like right? Sort of where that that the satellite that's moving sort of more vertically, just to the left of it, there's like another little line there. On mine? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, there could be another satellite going by. <laughs> Three satellites in the same. Going to hit each Show other. off. There is wow. all sorts of junk up there. It's very annoying. Yeah. <laughs> I just tried to do an image of M31 and I hit my house. Oh. You hit your Move house? your house. Yeah, I hit your... my house. Yeah. In that your house got in the way of your image or your telescope actually no, bonked no, no, into no, your no. house? My, my house? No, my house got in the way of the image. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> yeah, because we, we see that, uh, you know, in the, in the virtual star party video that has Gary in it, right? He actually bonks his, uh, his, his telescope right into the camera, I think. Yeah, yeah. Too close. <laughs> too close. Too close. <laughs> That's great. Cool picture. Okay, so I'm going to show you. So this is Gary's, and this is what? A two-minute exposure, Gary? This is a two-minute at, uh, again, hydrogen alpha. And this so, is so that's here. we're looking at the specific shade of red made when an electron goes from the third energy level to the second energy level in a hydrogen atom, and a photon is released, so you have to have energy in order to get red light. And the flame nebula here, and right here is Alnatech, I believe it's the, the left-hand star in the belt of Orion. Right. That's right. Yep. Um, oh, and uh, Eric Briggs says, the horse head is very close to the celestial equator, so there's a larger risk of hitting geosynchronous satellites in the image. Yeah. Ah. So, so there's, okay. there's why you've gotten a ton of satellites in your view. Although geosynchronous wouldn't they um, go through that fast. Yeah, so so one of the reasons that the LSST cadence for in the future when the Large Synoptic Survey tells online is set for what it is, is so that it doesn't accidentally image spy satellites that are moving very slowly, imaging very set areas of the planet. Um, so yeah, some of these high things you, yeah. Who watches the watchers? Mm. Yes. I think those are what the telescopes down at uh, Whitestone Missile or, or White Sands Missile. Yeah, I'm sure they have plenty of big telescopes that watch spy satellites. I think it's Gary. Yeah. I've seen Gary. Telescope, Gary. Yeah. I watch yeah. everything. He's watching all the satellites, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's More like a... Uh... Behind the curtain. <laughs> all right, let's move over to Chris's view of Jupiter here. So uh, it's, a little, uh, it's a little hazy today, Chris. Uh, I think most of it's from... The bright moon. I can't really pull any more detail out of it. Yeah. And I'm using a junk camera, so I'm just using a regular $15 computer webcam, so can't expect a whole lot out of it. But don't you normally run a DSLR? Uh, yeah, but I, not for my planetary. I oh, right. I haven't yeah. been able to pull that off. An extra like webcam. Has. Yeah. Yeah. I just. So I use a Logitech webcam with a Barlow. And... Right. So I'm going to move to Mark's view again. And uh, and he's going, did you run down and fix your focus, Mark? Yeah, actually I had to run up. So I'm running upstairs because <laughs> I'm in my basement. So I have to run upstairs to go out on my back patio, put my slippers on so I don't get snow all over my socks. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't going to demand it, but I really appreciate your uh, you know your dedication to the cause. Oh, it looks way better. I'm taking it looks video way now better. so I can stack it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look at that. That's beautiful. Pamela, which craters are those? No, I, I won't. No ask. idea. No idea. <laughs> I, I, I love how the fact that you can see that so close to the full moon there that right on the ridges of those craters on the Terminator, yeah. you can just barely see the light coming over. Yeah. It would be so interesting to stand like on one of those craters and see across the crater and see that shadow moving up. It would be so... Cold and hot. Cold and hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
as you asphyxiated and yeah, boiled. But, it, well, but you get the view. Space suit. Yeah, yeah space, space suit. suit. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. That would be really cool though. Yeah. You could just watch that all day. <laughs> Neat. Now, are there any parts you can get any more detail on, Mark? Because you're using the digital zoom, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm I'm using the uh, the five X digital zoom. The, so this is my full full frame view right here. Yeah. Um, if I wanted to get any closer, I'd have to switch out my optical train and, and put an eyepiece in and do some projection. But this is just prime focus. No, it looks great. It no, looks yeah, great. This, but but just your movie you know, looks really good. If you want to sort of explore around on that on that five times, even the five times zoom looks fantastic. What what would you like to look at? Uh, some moon nights. Surprise! Surprise us. Yeah. Um, some moon nights. Some moon nights. <laughs> Where are those moon weasels at? <laughs> 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 They're visiting I think the, moon, man. On the moon, right? Future um, you can find one of the flags. Uh, so somebody asked for M thirty three, which we, I, we could do, I guess. I can try. It may be a little low for me, but I can yeah. give it a try. I've got M thirty five right now. Okay. All right. Study. Sure. Um, uh, Tom Nath asked a question, which I I don't know if we know the answer. How fast does the lunar terminator move? Yeah. How? Don't everybody jump in at once. No, I. That's... We're waiting for oh, Pamela. Oh, to get back. oh, Pamela dropped just in time. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> I'm back now. I know you're back now. You missed it. Just an abs. No. Uh, Tom Nath asks, and you might have to do some math. Um, how fast does the lunar Terminator move? So if you were standing there and watching the Terminator move, or if you were standing in it, could you outrun the Terminator? I wonder. I don't know, but I can do that math, and we'll have it tomorrow for Astronomy Cast. Nah, don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, it'd be, it'd be fairly simple math to. to well, let's see. Out. Yeah, because it would yeah. take it would take. It's it figure twenty eight days, to move through days. The, first, the full cycle, and then and the, then it's two pi r for the distance that it moves if you're at the equator. And the moon is. I just what, don't know the value of r. Thirteen Let me look it up and do it. You guys look at something. I'll run the calculation right now. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay, thank you, Pamela. Uh, okay. Tom, uh, hang tough. Pamela will run your calculations for you. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I've got a calculus exam coming up, Pamela. I'm just going to have you on my phone a friend. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no? Pamela, can, yeah. Can, can everyone include you, Pamela, as their phone a friend if they get their space question? Space questions, yes, not yeah, calculus right. questions. Um, uh, Chris... Chris Kzer on YouTube says that last USA Monday morning was flying at 37,000 feet and saw a view of the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud, and it was amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm jealous. Ty Tyrian 2006 has calculated as 15.4 kilometers per hour. That sounds about right. Hold on. Ah, keep going. I'm continuing right, to fail. Forward. All right, so we're going to move to, sorry, so Stuart, you had... This is M35, and um, the M35 is an open cluster near Orion, and that's sort of the one in the lower part of the image. And if you look, there's a little uh, fuzzy bit uh, up yeah. to the right of it. Um, that's another cluster that's completely unrelated to M35 and much, much farther away, and I forget the name of it. Um, uh, I, I don't have it open to look it up. It's some, you know, NGC. It's an NGC sure. object, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure what it is, but nevertheless, it's. I just like M35 because you can see the two little clusters near each other. It's neat to have a cluster within a cluster, right? Right. <laughs> Eric Briggs predicts that you could an astronaut could outrun the lunar terminator. So, and Teal is guessing 370 kilometers a day at the equator. So. Or 15.4 kilometers per hour at the equator, yeah. And that's another thing to, to think about, too, at the equator, because when you're talking yeah. about that, you know. Yeah. It's gonna be okay, I'm getting quiet. 370 kilometers per day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Other so people that's, that's Google a, faster than I do. Right. And so turn that into per hour, right, which is 15.4. Yep. So. Ty Tyrian yeah. 2006 gets the, uh, gets the award. You get a Are high you... five from the Internet. Are you faster than a PhD astrophysicist? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to move to uh, 
Gary's view of the monkey head, right? That is it. Nice. Oh, nice. it's rotated. And if I rotate it, well, I didn't rotate it because if I go this way, let me go. This yeah, way. it's there. We go. Now you monkey. can see it, but it doesn't take up the whole screen. Ooh, That's okay. Ah, ah. <laughs> eyes and brow, nose. Yeah. I remember when you I first showed this, this. One. this thing was awesome. Yeah. Let be the monkey head. I'll and if you saw this post. in color, it would be a beautiful red image. Yes. A red monkey. <laughs> but I probably couldn't see it from here. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think it's really important to uh, to know that with Gary's view, he's got this very specific, as you mentioned, he's viewing this hydrogen alpha. He's got this really tight wavelength that that can get through the horrible light pollution he has in the Los Angeles area. So it's either this or nothing, right? Pretty much. Yeah, without yeah. the filters, yeah. I can get some, but nothing spectacular. But it's great to take that telescope. I know you've taken that telescope on the road a few times. and I have. Yeah, and I it's got to just be stunning at places like Joshua Tree or... Yeah. Yeah, out by the Salton Sea. Um, ah. Done a few there, but... Um, yeah, I'm getting a little too old to do that. Anyway. <laughs> I, I've told you, if you want to go anywhere, I've got a strong back. And we're pretty close. <laughs> All yeah. right. That that would come I'll along for the ride. Mule. That'll come along for the ride too. So. Okay. Yeah. I'll be your there pack you mule. All right, Gary. It's a road trip. All right. We just decide. We'll okay. It. And and Lewis, you're going to show us something from the past. <laughs> yes, here's an image of M33 from uh, October a year ago, and uh, millions of years ago. Yes, a long time That's ago. Beautiful. It's it's uh, a stack of eight images, each uh, 300 seconds long, of uh, M33 that somebody asked That's for. That's really Whoa. good. Oh, eight, eight images, each 300, 300 seconds. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And that's how you get all the nebulosity, yeah. all of the knots in the arms, and you can really start yeah. to see the dark lanes as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, people need to really understand that that what we do with these virtual star parties is quick and dirty, and uh, you know. You know, two-minute exposure is as long as we will tend to tend to do them yeah. for really faint objects. But to do this kind of stuff, you know, sometimes people are producing images that they've spent all yeah. night on one image. You know, hours and hours of light gathered together and merged together and stacked to produce these really detailed images. Yeah, and I find in many cases I'll spend almost as much time doing the image processing after the fact as actually acquiring the image to pull out the detail and... I do way more time because yeah. I don't know what I'm doing yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. So as, you, as your skill improves, your time decreases. Um, so Sylvan uh, Westby says that M35's companion is NGC 2158. Attaboy. There you go. <laughs> That's go cool. Go team. Huh? <laughs> go team. Thank, thanks, Internet. It's like we've got a bigger brain. So I'm going to go back to this moon... I gotta say, when it's like this full moon, it's a really nice. It is a nice image, although it's nice when it's like a little less than this. Could you do anything about that, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Could you decrease the uh, the the age of the moon a little bit? Yeah, can you go back in time a little bit? You know, yeah. do your Superman fly around backwards. Yeah, grab the moon. You know, it, it, if I had those kind of uh, superpowers, do you think I'd be hanging out with you guys on a Sunday night? <laughs> Possibly. 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 Yes. Yeah. Probably. Yes. Yeah, actually. Yeah. All right. All right. So I'm going back to Stuart's. Uh, going back to Stuart's view here. And it's like, is this, this the double cluster, Stuart? This no. Is, this, this is the double cluster. Yeah. So it's, it'll be one of the last images of the double yeah. cluster of the season because it's pretty low. Um, uh, but um, you know, this this is. Uh, actually a very, very pretty thing that you can see with binoculars. And it's one of the first things that you can see in a with just a visual telescope. And it's very, very pretty just in, in an eyepiece. And I actually think this is one of the things that's prettier in an eyepiece than it is, you know, when you're trying to image it. What I find really neat about the double cluster is that red star in between uh, the two elements of the cluster that actually is the color seems to be uh, pretty easy to discern in the telescope, you know, by eyeball as well. Yeah, I, I pretty much uh, squeezed out all the color just to kind of get the star glow, I mean, the, the sky glow out. So it's, all you're just seeing is white and black here. It's not really resolving for me. I'm not sure if it's a connection thing or something. I'm okay, it resolved here. 
Did it? Okay. But it could just be my view of it then. Could be your sideways rain. <laughs> no. no, but it's, I can see the small, the thumbnail. For, I don't know. The Hangouts have been acting a little funny this last week, actually. I don't know if you've noticed that. We had, on Friday, we couldn't mute Amy. Yeah. She a title, and, and she was having a lot of, like, noise with her microphone. There was no way that we could mute her. And, and I didn't see myself in the thumbnail, but I saw myself on the big screen. So anyway, this is just clearly Hangout nonsense. But um, hopefully we can get to the bottom of this. What am I going to do now? I'm going to go back to the moon, I've decided. Chris, are you I clouded out there? I, I think he, he, he ran off for a second. Did he run off? Okay, all right. So sorry, I, I, I actually yeah. am going to be, be evil and share an image from earlier this <laughs> evening that I took. Where Is you this can live? Very... No, sadly. This is about three hours old, four hours old now. Um, of of the moon down near the horizon, and you can start to see the moon illusion. Um, the moon doesn't change size as it gets up above the horizon, but when you see it down near the horizon, it can seem much, much bigger um, just because our brain sees it near objects that we understand the size of, and then I exaggerated it even more using a high-power lens. Oh, okay. Now I'm seeing they're like right above that silo. Yeah, above right above the silo. It's a very faint moon. Tonight, uh, the moon was still up while the sun was up, or it rose while the sun was up, and tomorrow the moon rises 10 minutes after sunset here in the St. Louis area. And um, I wanted to see if I could capture all the snow in the harvested cornfield, and uh, the answer was sort of kind of maybe. <laughs> now, can you show that, that other picture that you took, the one of the sun, of the, was it the sunrise or the sunset? Sunset. Yeah, hold on. That's a different. That was in here. Um, so. Oh, go ahead. So, so this is the sun setting over um, a frozen horse jumping arena, and what you're seeing is the pattern that the water made as it melted more where there was particulates in the snow and less where the snow was cleaner, and you end up with this weird dimpling effect and scattered light. And you can also start to see how the sky, uh, depending on the thickness of the atmosphere, varies with color. And I got a time series that actually exemplifies Raleigh scattering really well. So when the, when the sun is high in the sky, you see nice blue sky, white snow. But then as the sun sets, everything gets redder and redder as we're seeing the sun through more and more atmosphere. And so it's strictly an effect of how much atmosphere the sunlight has to pass through. And just the distance difference between these two and how orange the light com is, appears to come through, that's what produces the golden hour that photographers rely on. And you can really see that the light of everything does get redder and redder through the evening. And then we have moonlight. So Raleigh that's scattering really nice is the photographer's friend. So yeah, I, I did fun. a I did a time lapse. I'm not I'm sure I'm gonna be able to sh not gonna be able to show it, but um, did a time lapse of the moon, which oh maybe it's gonna work. This isn't gonna work very well. Hold on, let me see if I can do it. And that's one just to show off. <laughs> um, let's see if this is working here. There's me. But I really want. Um, we'll go back to the moon. Oh no, we're gonna go to Stuart's view. Oh, actually, Gary's got a new view too. I've uh, got the M1. We were killing time, so and now we're back. Okay, I'm gonna go to Gary's view first with M1. Yep. Which is the namesake, the the image, the icon we use for the space community on Google Plus, which happens to be the uh, largest community on Google Plus. Well, and in color, this is much prettier because all I'm seeing is the hydrogen. Right. I'll give you an idea of that here in just a second. Oh, nice. Yeah. Let's 
the the Crab Nebula M1 or NGC yeah. 1952. And this is, you know, I mean, this object detonated as a supernova within, you know, historical times, right? This is about, what, 1054? I always get it wrong. And, and what's awesome about this one is we've actually been able to see over the period that we've had photography, so just over the past 150 years or so, the expansion rate, and we can measure how quickly it's expanding uh, just by seeing the knots and filigrees slowly overcome the surrounding stars. There was a really neat activity done by Sky and Telescope probably about 10 years ago that you may be able to get your hands on in a local library. That's really cool. It's like the um, uh, the V, was it 838 Mon? Mon, yeah. Yeah, where, right, where they, you know, they get a view of the Hubble Space Telescope and you can kind of see the expansion of this Nova event and then a few years later they did it again and you get more expansion and then you time lapse it, you can see just the changes of this material coming out of the of this star. I mean, <clears throat> you think when you see these objects that they're all very stable and very you know, static, but actually these things are changing in the sky in front of us. And this, this, you know, this supernova remnant that we see only detonated a thousand years ago. And a few thousand years from now, this thing will have faded away, you know, so that it's not very visible anymore. That, that what look like these very bright objects that we see in the night sky are sometimes, you know, very temporary. And and the awesome thing about V eight thirty eight Mon is is it's two flashes that are two different colors that are propagating out. So you end up with all sorts of interesting color mixing as as the light reflects back at different times and different places. And the material that the light's reflecting off of is material that was in the past blown off by the star. So it it created this and illuminated this all for itself. Well, I'm going to move to uh, Stuart's view. And I have no idea what we're looking at. Yeah, that's why it's such a it's a horrible, horrible picture. This is uh, this is a comparison to the M thirty three that was shown before. Right. Um, this is a two minute shot, low in the sky, near a street light, with a moon sky, with a dust moat in the middle of it. Um, uh, was it uphill both ways? Yeah, uphill <laughs> both, both ways. ways just, okay. just to show the difference between a quick image and a long exposure image, and why long exposure astrophotography is so important. Yeah. And so you can barely kind of see the. It's it's really horrible. But I just threw it in there just because. Um, you know, I, I took it. And it's it's nice for a comparison. I'm seeing it looks almost like ripples. I don't know if that's. Yeah, that's that's uh, cro the light. that's um no 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 that's artifact from because in order for me to actually see it, I had to do just a heavy histogram stretch in Photoshop. Um, oh, okay. Otherwise, it would have just been totally dim. And so that's what that's that's artifact from that. Okay. Now, Tom R. is asking, with the Crab Nebula, what kind of star would it have been before it exploded? Hot one. <laughs> A big one? Um, so, there, there was recent research that figured out what type of progenitor star it was. I don't have it off the top of my head. I believe it was a single large star that exploded, but let me verify. I'm going to move back to Chris's view, and he's got the whole moon here. He's got the whole moon in his telescope. In my in telescope. telescope. Yeah, totally. I was having a little trouble with everything here, and it's excruciatingly cold, negative three C here. Oh, oh dear. Oh man. Well, we're 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 only going to make you suffer for another like fifteen oh, minutes or so. I'm all right. I've got my hand warmers, and I got stuff <laughs> in my boots. So touching all the metal parts on the telescope is just what's cold. <laughs> it's, good. it's 45 degrees F here and we're freezing. Oh God. thanks Gary. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to help. I'll be I'll be polite in the on air version of the virtual star party. <laughs> <laughs> what's this Stuart? Is this is this Yes, yeah, so I I I gave, I gave in to the inevitable. And yeah, this this is the uh, you need to keep your uh, enemies closer, right? Yeah, exactly. Right, know so, your enemy. Right. So this is this is um, was taken about I don't know uh, three or four minutes ago. So it's I I, I think it's called the moon. <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's is it our moon? moon? Yeah. Someone's moon? Yeah. Might be ours. I don't know. Yeah. 
three but, or four minutes ago. But, That's not live. Come on. No, I know. Stuart. But just to be clear, just to be clear, right? This is Stuart's view is a photo as opposed to uh, what Chris and Mark are doing. Chris right, and Mark they're, they're are doing live. Videos. I, I'm I'm actually running Mark. I'm running two computers, so I'm imaging with one, and then I'm broadcasting with the other. So I have to transfer the file from one to the other. Um, it's the, it's the only way that I can I can make it go with Gary's program. So I've got a request here for M64, the Black Eye Galaxy. Is that up? I will find out. I don't out. know. So, so to go back in and finish answering the question on the Crab Nebula, its progenitor star is actually somewhat curious. It may have been a Wolf Ray star that had an obscene amount of solar mass of stellar mass loss. Um, due to winds. One of the problems they have in um, identifying exactly what the progenitor was is the mass of the surrounding nebula and the mass of the neutron star in the center of the nebula don't quite add up to what people think they should add up to, so it, it, there's a missing mass problem. It was definitely a core collapse supernovae, so giant star, sort of like the ones that we saw in the Orion Nebula earlier this evening, Giant stars that had massive amounts of mass loss, burned up their cores, hit that iron core point, and underwent core collapse and supernova explosion. It, we lost Fraser. We did. So uh, I just checked in. Uh, yeah, Lewis confirmed as well. Uh, M64 is really, really low on the horizon, so I don't think we'll be able to pull that up there. Which that was for, I think, Jamie. Sorry, Jamie. We won't be able to do that this this week. Please, Chris, you. Oh. are you the one that has the strange Cylon noise? Um, I'm not sure. Can Could you be. try muting? Yes, yeah, it's Chris. So yeah. You sounded like you have a Cylon breathing over your shoulder. <laughs> That's great. Could be, the, could be the truck sitting over about a block away from me. <laughs> no, but it, it definitely sounds I'll, like it's just the microphone is picking up its own sound or something. Yeah, it's like some kind of. Okay. Yeah. I'll unmute. So. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Who knew technology would be so complicated? Who knew? I, I mean, knew. If only we had someone from Vonage that could help us with this noise canceling yeah. view. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to move to Gary's view because there's something. I don't this, think we've ever seen this before. This is M78. Um, and it's not real good. I'm pretty close to the moon at this point. Yeah. But it is uh, M78. There's a lot of dark in here. This would probably be better with full color. And no, I don't think I've imaged this before. What is it? Uh, it's a nebula. Um, there's a couple of nebulosities in... Um, this, area, this is one. So, so one of the reasons it doesn't look so great is because this is a reflection nebula. So most of its light is blue wavelengths. Um, so it's reflected mm. continuum light, and and so your happy little H alpha filter is being rather unhappy. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's like the 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 wavelength of light that he's able to pick up is not coming through. It's all getting blocked by that horrible horrible light pollution. Yeah. Right, and I'm trying. Um, I'm trying a bunch of new things, but some of them aren't working out well. So Scott is showing us what it could look like, if we, I guess, if if we're just using a computer, just just looking yeah, at a simulation. If, if you were cheating, you like Scott yeah. was. Then. Now, yeah, Lewis, is this the same object, that, Scott? Yeah, this is M78 from. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when, uh, but this is many many images stacked together, processed. So uh, it's definitely cheating. That's okay. You but, can but you can see it. So if in your head you can take the two images and flip, so that the big blobs are lined up, it it's literally a take and flip like this. Problem between Lou's image and Gary's image. So if you can make that mental flip, you can see where the big and the little blobs of light line up. Now you need to do this. And you can it, see those dark lanes there. through this object. Yeah. Yeah, so now they're lined up the same, and so you can see how they line up. 
and the majority of this light is is blue light um, because the red light is getting scattered out by the by sorry the blue light is getting scattered out and the red light is passing straight through so what we're seeing is you have a cloud of material light is passing into the edge of it from the side relative to our field of view and then the blue light gets ref gets reflected towards the observer uh, so I've got a question here uh, from Death Guitarist 12 and in Registax what are wavelets and how does one use them that's probably not a, an, a question we can answer quite quickly in in this, but I don't know if anyone has a quick answer to that. Um, there are little magic sliders that I play with until it looks good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> little magic sliders. Play with them until they look good. Yeah, it's Stay like tuned. a little burger, right? Stay tuned white for another magic sliders. intro to astrophotography hangout. I'm going to explain that in another one. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh -huh. So what I, what I wanted to do then was pitch and advertise the fact that Chris is has been doing uh, a series of hangouts about you know astrophotography and so this is a when are you going to be doing the next one Chris? Um, I haven't set the date yet but probably within the next month I would say okay um, yeah I usually just try to do it on a day off um, they just kind of wing it. get those anymore um, so I, I'm going to be doing a couple more I pulled okay. down an astrophotography book in the library that explained wavelengths and it, it was math that was way over my head. So, um, hey, so we'll get Stuart involved yeah. in my hangout too. So. Yeah, they're, they're magic sharpening <laughs> sliders. Magic sharpening sliders. Perfect. I right. use uh, the wavelets and the pix insight quite a bit and essentially uh, the way I think about it is it's a way of um, being able to isolate features in the image by what their size or scale is and then being able to apply different kinds of sharpening or enhancement algorithms to things at different scales. So, I mean, if you think about like a galaxy is a fairly large scale image, uh, you can do something to it uh, versus, say, softening the background noise, which are fairly small scale images. How it all works, I have no idea. It's some kind of magic, you know, software inside. <laughs> I see. You just keep going back to magic sliders. Yeah. There's there's unicorns in the software, and they're just <laughs> <laughs> and they do math. Yeah, <laughs> math unicorns. Math in the software. unicorns. Math is oh hard. man, you're gonna make me install this so I can figure out what it is, so that I don't. <laughs> See, so it's electronics that's magic, and when you see the smoke, that's the magic escaping. Software isn't magic. Software <laughs> is just like nice, pretty lines of code. <laughs> yeah, but you're the pretty? you're the coder. Yeah. We always we pretty always joke lines. about this that that I'm the one with the computer science degree, and Pamela's the one that does all the coding. That's <laughs> <laughs> what happens. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the problem is that you just you know in your even your in astronomy work, there's so much just dealing with databases and trying to get it your is. information that you have to do coding. Yeah. So. Someone's got to do it. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Project Toxcart says that M1 theoretical models of supernova explosions suggest that the star that exploded to produce the Crab Nebula must have had a mass between 9 and 11 times the mass of the Sun. So. Which is true. Go. They just can't find all the mass, which is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> just like, Where did like, you like, go, Math? <laughs> what, what, yeah, like here? How do you weigh a cloud of expanding, you, you know, gas? And you dust? you you can estimate uh, the density of it based on how the light passes through it and how much scattering there is and how much color attenuation there is, and yeah. then you can measure the physical size of it based on the expansion rate, the known distance, and and so they can actually do a pretty good job of saying know the density, know the size, calculate the volume, calculate the mass, and there's not enough there, mm. so. Uh, so we've got. I think we've got one last object tonight, and we, I think we, then we'll have run out, um, and the stupid moon. Uh, so, <laughs> so Stuart, uh, what? It's hard because the moon is beautiful, but it's also evil. Yes. This. I, well, I. Um, the, what, the, my previous image was a terrible one of the pinwheel galaxy. This is the pinwheel cluster. And not quite sure why it's called the pinwheel. I don't really see a pinwheel in it's there. Gonna be, it's going to be. We're all doing this, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's 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 uh, what this is. Pinwheel cluster. Cool. That's great. Maybe if we spin around really quick, it blurs and looks like a <laughs> pinwheel spinning. Yeah. All I can figure is somebody had really bad optics. <laughs> well, but maybe if you do like a really long exposure, then some more fainter shapes no. come out of the stars. No. 
No, the people who named this did not have long exposures. The people who named this had worse optics, so you really do have to see things slightly out of focus to figure out why they were named. But I always wonder, you know, about those objects like the Pac-Man cluster, right? Like, yeah. What did they call it before the game Pac-Man came out? Right? The cheese you just blew my mind. I know. I know. So, so there's all these objects that they're they're but, looking for the better name because the thing hasn't been, ex you know. So where's the iPhone Nebula, right? <laughs> right. So these things need renaming as the, you know, as we see the Segway Nebula. That's all I'm saying. No. <laughs> no. Some things the, the do Prius, not need to be immortalized. The Prius Nebula. Okay. Um, the Prius. No. <laughs> oh, Lewis. The Red Ring of Death. Lewis Wait, Gary has great. something beautiful. We can end on. Is that a oh, drama? That's a that drama. Let's, Andromedia. And, and Andromedia. actually, it is. It is definitely washed out. I mean, that moon is killing you. Evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You but you can sit there laughing. But that's a that's a two minute. Yeah. It looks so much like a comet. But Gary, my house isn't in your way. What, I I'm sorry. <laughs> Move your house. <laughs> All right. Well, let's wrap this up then. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you very much, Chris, for bringing this beautiful vision, the this beautiful Jupiter and this beautiful Moon, uh, with the dust motes. Uh, <laughs> thanks to thanks to Gary Ganella for this uh, wonderful view of the uh, of Andromeda. That was fantastic. Lewis, thank you for digging into your archive and, and showing us uh, what it looks like when you cloud. Oh, look at your tagline, clouds. So sad. <laughs> yeah. oh. So that's what you can do when you uh, when you do big long exposures. So as as you said, you know, here in the show, we are just giving you just a sneak preview of what you can do if you spend a whole night uh, getting a view. Thanks, Mark. It was great to see you again. I haven't seen you in months, so it's awesome. I hope to be on more often when the weather cooperates. We're bringing the band back together, so this is great. Uh, Dr. Pamela Gay, and we're going to be recording an episode of Astronomy Cast tomorrow, uh, Topic Unknown. Oort Cloud. I Skyped or it to you. Okay, let's do the Oort Cloud. That sounds great. We're going to talk about the Oort Cloud tomorrow, which is really appropriate because there's tons of comets this, uh, this year. This is the year of yes. the comets. Scott Lewis. The year of the dragon, but okay. Is it the year of the dragon? The year of the dragon comments. Scott Lewis. Yes. Yeah, uh, everyone get ready. If anyone's in the Austin area in two weeks, we will be down at South by Southwest doing our virtual star party from down there also. So yeah, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in two weeks, yeah. we will all be down there. Fraser, Pamela, Nicole, myself. We th we'll be there with NASA and the James Webb Space Telescope doing some outreach, doing our hangouts, doing some citizen science with CosmoQuest. So if anyone is, is either attending South by Southwest or in the te uh, in the Austin area, it's going to be free. So you can you can all come down there, see the full-scale model of the James Webb Space Telescope, and we would love to come say hi. Uh, yeah, if you want to find us, just look for the gigantic life-sized James Webb Space Telescope model. Yes, it's the, the size of a tennis court. It's the size of a table. It will be hard to miss, and we will be sort of in the area orbiting the, the, the model, so it will be easy to find. Yeah. Zilker Park, for those Zilker of you who know the area. Okay, all right. Be in Zilker Park down by, the, down by the river, or Town Lake, depending on what you want to call it. And uh, Stuart Foreman, thank you very much. And uh, if you could move your house for next week, that would be, uh, that would be really much appreciated. Yeah. All right. Yeah, just so we'll see you next week. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> yeah, without my house. <laughs> oh, very cool. Trip. You just made Stuart homeless. Do you feel, yep. <laughs> feel good, Fraser? <laughs> uh, I, was, I was just too lazy to walk up the hill today. But... I thought you oh. went uphill both ways. <laughs> <laughs> In the awesome. snow. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching, and we will see you all next week and then live from Austin the week after that. So, Wow. We'll see you in a. We'll see you in a week. Uh, Good night. All. all right. Bye, everyone. Good night. <laughs>